a new thesis on the history of the Newport Tower. Who built the 28-foot-tall stone and mortar structure that stands in Toro Park in the heart of Newport today, and why? In this engraving from the 1800s, vines were allowed to grow on top of the tower. Uh, back in the 1800s, it was suggested that the tower might have been a Viking round church, and then other people have suggested it was a watchtower built by Portuguese explorers, a temple built by the Templars, or even a lighthouse built by Chinese navigators. Before the houses were built around the park, <clears throat> the tower once had a beautiful sweeping view of what is now Newport Harbor in Jamestown. In his 1677 will, the first governor of Rhode Island, Benedict Arnold, who was the great-great-great-grandfather of the revolutionary t war trader of the same name, refers to the tower as my stone-built windmill. But Philip Means, who wrote the authoritative book Newport Tower in 1942, calls it the most unwindmill-like structure I have ever seen. First, all other colonial windmills in New England were ma are made from wood. Second, it has this unusual fireplace. Well, flour dust is more explosive than gunpowder, so the last thing you want in a windmill is a fireplace. One small spark and kaboom! Third, notice that the tops of each of the eight pillars that are down below have eight beam sockets on them. These would have uh, eight massive one foot by one foot beams, excuse me, four beams in a crisscross pattern that once supported a wooden floor. Here's the crisscross pattern, and here's what it would look like with a floor on it. This means that the fireplace is a wall fireplace, as opposed to most normal fireplaces that start out at floor level with a stone hearth in front of them. Another strange thing is that the fireplace has two flues that rise up through the middle of the wall for about ten feet, and then they exit out the exterior wall. Most fireplaces have only one flue. Also, most fireplaces have a lintel or a flat stone across the top, but this one has an arch. Structurally, an arch is stronger than a lintel, but look closely at the left end of this arch. Right where it needs its most support, there's a window. Why didn't the obviously very talented stonemasons simply locate the window a little further to the left? And above the fireplace, you can see the beam sockets for what was once uh, a second floor. <clears throat> and here, I've drawn in a, a simulation of what that floor would look like. So you see that this is a room that we're inside of now. In the room are three windows. The northeast window to the left of the fireplace, the south window over on the right, and this photo is taken from the west window. Now the curious thing about the windows is that they're all different shapes and sizes. They're different heights above the ground, and none of them is really symmetrically aligned with any of the pillars or the arches below them. Here's the three windows from a bird's eye point of view. In the mid-1990s, fellow researcher William Penhallow, an astronomy professor at the University of Rhode Island, discovered various astronomical alignments in the tower. Penhallow predicted that if you stood at a particular location in the park on the evening of December 25, 1996, the full moon will rise above the eastern horizon and be visible if you, if you look through the west window, through the first floor room, and out the northeast window. So I went there that night, and sure enough, he was right. Here is the simulation of the path that the the path that the moon took that evening. And here it is, the moment that it appeared through both of those windows. The unusual thing about this event is that it only happens once every 18 years. I call this the moon alignment. But in addition, Penhala also found an interesting solar alignment. He predicted that around the winter solstice, through different, in a different position at the northwest corner of the park, the sun would be visible through the west window, through the first floor room, and through the south window. Penhallow was right again. I photographed this alignment several times over the last few years, and it always happens, like clockwork. Penhallow also determined that on the equinox, a, a patch of light coming through the west window at sunset would shine on the right-hand edge of the fireplace. Here is the sun just before sunset on the equinox, and you see the light coming through the west window and shining on the corner of the fireplace. Here it is a little bit later, it's just before it's starting to fade. In this time-lapse sequence, shows a patch moving from the lower left 
and moving up and up and in the fourth frame the patch of light is directly below the fireplace. Shortly thereafter it, it fades a little bit because it gets blocked by the houses bordering the west side of Toro Park, but by interpolating the amount of time till the actual sunset I could see that Penhallow was right again. I couldn't help but wonder if this alignment was intentional, why didn't the builders arrange things so that the light set inside the fireplace? That would have been much cooler. Penhallow also suggested that the first floor room of the tower might have been a camera obscura solar disk calendar room. What does that mean? Well, being a professional photographer, I was familiar with the camera obscura. In a dark room with one small hole in it, an upside down and reversed image of what's outside appears inside projected on the inside wall of the room. The solar disk is simply the circular image of the sun in the sky area of the projected area of, uh, image of a camera obscura. And as the sun moves across the sky outside, the solar disk moves in the opposite direction across the walls and the floor inside. By putting various marks on the floors and walls, you can easily make a sundial that tells you the time of day and the day of the year. A camera obscura solar disk calendar room is just like an indoor sundial. The solar disk is just like the tip of the shadow of the gnomon of a sundial. To study this idea, I turned my photography studio into a camera obscura solar disk calendar room by drawing circles around the solar disk every minute. I made a record of the path that the sun took just before sunset. Each day, the path would shift over a little bit. During the summer, the solar disk was in this near area, but by winter, the solar disk at sunset was cleared at the far end of the studio. Here's a simulation of where the setting sun solar disks fell throughout the year. At the summer solstice, it was at the far right. At the fall equinox, it was, it was in the kitchenette in the middle. And at the winter solstice, it was at the far left. Then at the spring equinox, it returned to the kitchenette in the middle, and then so forth. I made a bird's eye view of uh, my calendar room to figure out all of the angles. And then I applied those angles to the, to the interior of the tower. And here's where the setting sun solar disk would be throughout the year. Notice that the middle disk falls at the right edge of the fireplace, just as Penhallow said. To get an idea of what a camera obscura uh, uh, inside of the first floor room of the tower might have looked like, I searched around Newport for a small room with a similar viewpoint over Newport Harbor. I spotted a small window at the top of an old firehouse tower on Lower Mill Street.